Hello friends, we are taking a new topic today, uh, it's a conceptual topic in CVS, the action potential in the Purkinje fiber in the heart and uh, what is so special about this uh, action potential in the Purkinje fiber. As I have given the title Plateau in the Purkinje. Uh, look, if you compare the action potentials in a nerve or a skeletal muscle, it will appear something like this with uh, the duration, total duration about 0.5 to 1.5 milliseconds only. Let us say on the average 1 millisecond, that is the duration of the action potential in a nerve or a skeletal muscle. Now, if you compare this with the action potential in the heart and uh, to be more precise in the Purkinje fiber and ventricular fiber, the action potential will appear like this. So, what is the duration of this action potential? 200 to 300 milliseconds. Watch that. 200 to 300 milliseconds as compared to just uh, 1 millisecond in a nerve or a skeletal muscle. So, uh, that is the big, big difference between a nerve action potential or a skeletal muscle action potential and its time of excitation. Compare that with Purkinje fiber or ventricular fiber action potential. Uh, the time duration, what is the significance? Look, uh, heart has to beat continuously uh, second after second after second, minute after minute after minute, uh, days on end, 24 by 7 and uh, for entire life. That means, uh, the two things that happen with the skeletal muscle should not happen with the cardiac muscle. What are those two things I am talking about? Tetanus and fatigue. You know, skeletal muscle shows the property of tetanus and uh, uh, it occurs from, uh, I mean, what is tetanus is sustained state of contraction and failure to relax. It occurs from a high frequency stimulation. Remember, high frequency stimulation uh, to the skeletal muscle. That is muscle tetanus. We may have experienced this uh, sometime or the other in our life. I have given this example uh, in one of the previous videos that when you are writing the exam and uh, you have less time left, you try to write very fast. And what happens is, uh, there are high frequency signals, high frequency stimulations going to the hand muscles, skeletal muscles of the hand. And you feel uh, at times that the muscles have gone into stiffness, sustained state of contraction. They are failing to relax for some time. Of course, they relax later. And uh, that is what is called as physiological tetanus. Now, why did that happen? from a high frequency stimulation. We stimulated the skeletal muscles of the hand with a very high frequency. Therefore, there was no time for the calcium from the sarcoplasm, if I may just draw it uh, as a quick diagram, with each impulse coming into the muscle via T tubule, it causes release of calcium into the sarcoplasm. And then the calcium has to be pumped out, pumped back to the T-tubule, uh, to the, uh, to those terminal cisterns of the longitudinal tubule, L-tubule, so that uh, the muscle is relaxed. But imagine if there is a high frequency stimulation, what is going to happen? Impulses keep coming into the muscle, calcium keeps getting released into the sarcoplasm and there is no time for the calcium to be pumped out, pumped back into the L-tubule terminal cisterns. So, muscle goes into a sustained state of contraction. Now, this happened 
in the skeletal muscle because it had a short action potential duration and it has a shorter refractory period. That's where bringing, we are bringing in the concept of today's uh, video. Relatively, if you see the nerve or the skeletal muscle, its refractory period is short. Its action potential duration itself is short and therefore the refractory period is short. It means what? Uh, you know, what is the refractory period? After each excitation, there is a immediate time period during which the tissue cannot excite again. Okay. At the end of that time period, the tissue is ready to be excited for one more time. So that time period is called as refractory period. Imagine if some tissues refractory period was uh, just one second, just giving the example. That means after every excitation, there has to be a one second gap and uh, immediate gap and then the tissue is, uh, has recovered again, it can excite again. So, but again, if it excites, again, one second gap has to be there, then the tissue will excite for the third time. So, such a tissue can maximally excite for 60 times in a minute. Uh, but imagine other tissue, the, the other tissue like say heart and let us assume that its refractory period is uh, 5 seconds. That means after every excitation the tissue has to wait for 5 seconds. I am just giving the example. It is not the case here actually. Just giving the example. So, 5 seconds refractory period means after every excitation you need to wait for 5 seconds and then the tissue can excite for one more time. That means such a tissue can be maximally excited at a frequency of only uh, 12 times in a minute. Yeah, Because every uh, excitation and you got to wait for 5 seconds, then your next excitation is possible for that tissue. So, refractory period being long means the tissue cannot be excited at high frequency, isn't it? And if the tissue cannot be excited at very high frequencies, the tissue, that muscle will not go into tetanus. Remember what was the de uh, definition for tetanus? Sustained state of contraction, failure to relax, which occurs from a high frequency stimulation. Now, in the case of skeletal muscle, it was possible high frequency stimulation because the refractory period was short, but not possible in the case of heart muscle because heart muscle has got long refractory period. You can see here the action potential duration is long. Compare the two, you will realize. And uh, of course, therefore, also the uh, refractory period in the heart muscle is long. So, that is the comparative feature. I mean, imagine the heart muscle has to uh, continuously undergo systole, diastole, systole, diastole. It has to diastole, relax and receive the blood. Then it goes into contraction and pumps the blood out. So, so uh, heart going into sustained state of contraction is unacceptable uh, then. Um, so, so, therefore, that is the importance of long action potential duration in the Purkinje fiber or in the ventricular fiber. And this is where the role of plateau in the action potential comes. Compare the two action potentials. What is the most striking feature uh, which separates the two action potentials? I mean, which, uh, which differentiates the two? Yes. This is that phase in the Purkinje fiber action potential which is missing here in the skeletal uh, nerve or a skeletal muscle's action potential, plateau phase. So, the first point that I am making here is plateau phase is the phase which separates the Purkinje fiber from, uh, from a nerve or a skeletal muscle. It is this phase, plateau, 
which is causing the action potential duration to be long and it is causing a long refractory period in the heart muscle. And due to this long refractory period, heart muscle cannot be excited at very high frequencies and it will not uh, show the property of tetanus which is shown by skeletal muscle. So, uh, that is the first basic point that I wanted to make. Of course, the, the other thing is skeletal muscle if it is stimulated for prolonged periods, uh, it, it undergoes fatigue, I mean it shows fatigue, it does not, it cannot sustain its contraction later on if you are contracting the muscle through the day, but at low frequency, not uh, at high frequency like in tetanus, but at a low frequency, the stimulations are going on, then eventually the muscle fatigues, which means what? Inability to contract normally with the normal strength, inability to respond normally, that is muscle fatigue. Now, uh, the skeletal muscle may show the property of fatigue and there are inherent circuits uh, in the spinal cord to delay that fatigue, you know, there is, there is Renshaw cell inhibition and many such circuits which prevent the muscle fatigue and yet skeletal muscle can afford to fatigue, I mean it can recover later, fine, we will not contract that muscle for some time, but heart muscle? heart muscle cannot afford to show the property of fatigue. It cannot stop, it has to beat forever with the optimum contractile power or strength of contraction. So, what happens is due to the long recovery time in the cardiac muscle, it gets enough time uh, to recover for its nutrients in the energy metabolism and therefore, heart muscle also does not show the property of fatigue, it would not uh, go into fatigue. Of course, uh, we see the conditions of uh, congestive heart failure where the muscle is failing as a pump, but that is a different story, we will talk about it later. The point here is due to this long refractory period, heart muscle cannot be excited at high frequencies, so it does not show tetanus and it gets enough recovery time so that it does, does not show the property of fatigue as well. So, that brings me to the moot point of this discussion, the plateau phase. The plateau phase in the Purkinje action potential uh, is the reason that uh, it has this long time duration and long refractory period. So, what is so, what is different in the heart muscle or in the Purkinje fiber? The different thing in the Purkinje fiber is the slow calcium channels, the so called slow calcium channels or L type voltage sensitive calcium channels. L type Look, calcium channels are of various types, uh, T type, T stands for transient, L stands for long lasting and then there are, there is N type, P slash Q type and so on. Here we are talking about L type voltage sensitive calcium channels or slow calcium channels. Now, they are slow to open and slow to close. So, if we look at the uh, the phases in the cardiac action potential. Phase 0, rapid upstroke. That is because of the fast sodium channels. Tetrodotoxin sensitive fast sodium channels. Tetrodotoxin is a poison found in puffer fish and it is the poison that blocks these fast sodium channels. So, these are sometimes called as tetrodotoxin sensitive fast sodium channels. Now then, that is the rapid depolarization. Then, this part, phase 1, then phase 2 is plateau of course, phase 3 and phase 4. These are the phases in the Purkinje fiber action potential. 
Um, let me make a distinction over here. The fibers in the entire thickness of the ventricle, they will show the plateau but with a difference. If you see the fibers in the epicardium, epicardium, outer wall of the heart and mid myocardium and the Purkinje fibers, their action potential will be something like this. The plateau is shown but with, with, a, with a square root appearance. It's, it's the so-called square root appearance. So, phase 0, phase 1 and phase 2 will be like this. Whereas, endocardial fibers in the inner wall, their action potential will be something like this. Phase 0, rapid upstroke and then... So, again, we got to make a distinction. Look, basically, I said this is the Purkinje fibers action potential or... Uh, in ventricular fibers, this is the action potential with the presence of plateau. Fine. But that plateau also, how does it occur? Whether there was early repolarization happening and then there was a plateau phase, which is typically called as a uh, square root sign, as you can see here, this, like a square root. So, this happens in the epicardial region epicardial ventricular fibers and otherwise after the depolarization there is straight plateau no early repolarization seen okay this is seen in the endocardial fibers so even in plateau we have uh, the variations now first of all phase 0 rapid upstroke it's because of the entry of sodium through fast sodium channels. And then phase 1, early repolarization. We all know that it's the potassium efflux which causes repolarization. Potassium exit, potassium leaving the cell. In the case of heart, there are various potassium channels particularly three important potassium channels in the heart, they are uh, or I am describing the current that passes through those channels. I, K, K uh, is for that potassium channel and I for the current through that channel. I, K, 1 or I, K, I and uh, potassium T O K T O transient outward that's T O and uh, I K I or 1 it stands for inward rectifying potassium channel or inward rectifying potassium current and this is transient outward potassium current. Uh, right, and this is our normal potassium channel which allows the potassium to exit and bring about the repolarization. So, phase 1 early repolarization is because of these potassium channels. Uh, K T O potassium T O transient outward potassium current. So, potassium starts leaving the Purkinje fiber and therefore there is repolarization. But then opening of slow calcium channels and uh, calcium now starts coming in. Calcium now starts coming in. So, we have calcium coming in and potassium going out. Uh, now, here I want to make a little important concept. Imagine calcium being a divalent cation. Okay. It will bring in lot of positive charges. If this was happening very rapidly, 
lot of positive charges will come in. And you know what they are likely to do here? They will push the potassium out very, very rapidly. Listen to this. Try to understand this. Potassium, intracellular potassium with a high concentration and low on the outside. That means potassium has got a concentration gradient from inside to outside. Potassium is expected to go out by concentration gradient. Now already sodium came in, in the first phase, phase 0, sodium has come in, means positive charges have come in. Imagine if the calcium also comes in and that too very rapidly, that means what will happen? Lot of positive charges will enter the Purkinje fiber and they will push the potassium out very rapidly. You know, because potassium being a cation and it moves out due to concentration gradient, means high potassium on the inside and low potassium on the outside. Potassium also moves because of the electrical gradient. It's called as electrostatic force or electrochemical gradient. Means more number of positive charges on the inside and relatively less number of positive charges on the outside. This will drive a cation like potassium from inside to outside. So imagine potassium is being favored to go out, out of the cell very rapidly. Concentration gradient is favoring it and electrical gradient also at this stage is favoring it. Means lot of positive charges have already come in. Sodium came in. Calcium is coming in, that means potassium will be driven out very rapidly. We don't want that to happen because if potassium leaves very rapidly, then repolarization will happen very rapidly. The graph will come down and the fiber will repolarize very rapidly. Its refractory period also will be over. We don't want that to happen. We want this phase to be sustained for 200 milliseconds. When will that be possible? That will be possible when calcium is coming in slowly. It is, it is bringing in positive charges and potassium is going out but not as rapidly. Potassium is not going out very rapidly. So, they are balancing out. Calcium coming in and potassium going out. They are balancing out. That is why that balancing out causes a flat phase. I mean, potential is neither going up nor going down. It's flat. That's the reason of for plateau. And here I want to mention inward rectifying potassium channels and inward rectifier potassium current. You know, uh, potassium can go out of the cell or potassium can come back into the cell by electrical gradient also. So, potassium can go out by concentration gradient, potassium can come back in by electrical gradient. Both movements are possible. Now, there are certain channels in the heart which are called as KIR. We have already mentioned it and the current is called as IKI, inward rectifying potassium channels. They allow more potassium to come in rather than the potassium to go out through them. Look, potassium can move either ways, okay? But there is a channel, the inward rectifying potassium channel or inward rectifier potassium channel, it allows more potassium to come in rather than go out, okay? That's why it's called as inward rectification, previously called as anomalous recti rectification. It's called as inward rectification for potassium movement. And because this inward rectifying potassium channels, uh, it is kind of balancing out the potassium exit. Potassium exit started happening, okay? This was phase 1. It was caused by transient outward potassium channels or current. But then 
we don't want that to happen very rapidly uh, uh, else what will happen repolarization will be completed very soon we don't want that to happen and therefore what is happening calcium is coming in slowly yes and potassium is not going out that rapidly because we have these channels inward rectifying potassium channels they allow movement of potassium to come in rather than go out so potassium going out is not that rapid at this stage okay uh, remember this i'll just briefly uh, explain once again potassium can go out by concentration gradient you know that very well but potassium can also go out by electrical gradient potassium being the cation it moves from high number of positive charges to low number of positive charges as well and that's called as diffusion by electrical gradient already in the purkinje fiber in the phase 0 sodium has come in so lot of positive charges have come in and slow calcium channels have opened so calcium is also coming in and in fact it is bringing in two positive charges uh, with each calcium ion divalent cation so what is likely to happen is lot of positive charges will accumulate and an electrical gradient will uh, get created from inside to outside so potassium can be driven out by concentration gradient as well as electrical gradient and therefore possibility is that potassium would be thrown out very rapidly and repolarization will happen very very rapidly but that does not happen because of this additional channel which we have spoken of inward rectifying potassium channel uh, kir that's uh, potassium channel name and the current is called as iki or ik1 inward rectifying potassium current it causes potassium to come in through the channel rather than uh, go out and that therefore uh, leads to this fact that we have a plateau for a long duration and repolarization does not happen let me just add one more point here uh, a small concept i told you already that epicardial fibers and endocardial fibers they have a different shape for the plateau why that's because of the density of these channels potassium channels look if there is a density of potassium channels the transient outward potassium channels and the current is called as ito transient outward potassium current and the channels if their density is good like it is in the epicardial fibers if the density of these channels is there it's good then potassium exit will happen transient outward potassium exit will happen and therefore repolarization this early repolarization will take place okay therefore you see in the epicardial fibers this early repolarization is happening but these channels they are not that dense in the endocardial region so there is no early repolarization seen in these perkin uh, in the endocardial uh, fibers repolarization early repolarization which was visible here is not visible in the endocardial fibers because those potassium channels responsible and that potassium current which was responsible for this phase early repolarization phase those potassium channels are not much uh, dense over there in the endocardial region so plateau phase and uh, the the physiology behind the plateau phase but just remember it's a slow calcium channel which is uh, the, an additional factor in the in the case of cardiac muscle or heart and uh, the potassium channels now eventually calcium channels will close so calcium influx has stopped plateau is over and then phase 3 will be uh, repolarization continued now that's because of uh, the normal potassium current you know potassium goes out and it causes repolarization so this has been called as delayed rectification or delayed rectifying potassium current 
and uh, it's more of going out of potassium from inside to outside potassium is going out from inside to outside its diffusion is causing this delayed rectification and then uh, uh, phase 4 will be near about RMP. So, uh, these are the phases and I wanted to focus more on the potassium channels in the heart and the slow calcium channels which are responsible for uh, the typical plateau phase. Remember the potassium channels, this is a normal potassium channels which is going to cause that delayed rectification phase 3. Then uh, inward rectifying potassium channel which will kind of bring the potassium back into the cell uh, Purkinje fiber or the ventricular cell rather than potassium allowed to go out very rapidly. That will not be, that will not cause plateau to be sustained and uh, graph will come down, repolarization will happen very rapidly. So, that is where the role of slow calcium coming in, I mean uh, calcium entering slowly and at the same time potassium not going out very rapidly. Remember that is the point I was making. Potassium should not go out very rapidly. There were all forces which were driving the potassium out. The, uh, the concentration gradient, the electrical gradient, both are driving the potassium out very rapidly. It should not happen. So, uh, inward rectifying potassium channels, they see to it that some potassium is coming back rather than a lot of potassium going out and therefore positive charges coming in and plateau will be sustained. Some potassium of course is going out because it has the concentration gradient uh, and the differences with this uh, endo epicardial and endocardial fibers, the square root sign particularly seen in the epicardial fibers. So, that is uh, the reason for plateau phase in the Purkinje fibers and that is what is different in Purkinje compared to nerve action potential or a skeletal muscle action potential and this is why heart muscle does not show tetanus and heart muscle does not fatigue. So, that uh, was the today's discussion on action potential in the Purkinje fiber.